thank you for being here. Thank you for being on time. I had a lot of really good feedback actually after the last session in um, the beginning of this month where we highlighted these six different ingredients for high performance team. And I was very conscious of putting these together in the modern world, meaning, you know, in the post COVID virtual world in, uh, that people are working in now, there, there are different ways that you need to lead teams. And so I was conscious of just trying to give you the very latest that I was aware of, at least in terms of um, the way the best teams are performing, what they focus on. So today, what I'm going to quickly do is do a refresh on this session, just in like five minutes, just to reset the scene and then open it up for Q&A so that if you have questions about how do we, what are, what are the nuances around ID and this whole concept of high performance teaming, we can dig into those. I already have some questions from people that we can um, start with, but if you've got them, either put them in the chat and we'll answer them. Um, and thank you to people like Greg and Ian and others that drive the chat. I, you know, the chat is an equally legitimate part of the webinar as much as me and the presentation here. Um, so there's sort of two webinars going on at the same time, but um, that just makes it, you know, even better. So use the chat and let's make this a really interactive session. The key to the ID Masterclass is we take the topic from the month, in this case, high performance teaming, and dig into the nuances of ID for those who are really trying to sharpen their skills around you know, the, the understanding of ID and the understanding of the whole ID, like how all drives work together in, in relation to these topics. So that's what we're going to dig into. Are there any questions or recommendations or anything before I start? Great. So let's get underway. So we talked about the six essential ingredients for a high performance team. And if I just go through those with you here, um, it always starts, it doesn't really matter what we do. The first step always is to check yourself. And are you coming from a good place? If you're not in stride, then anything else we're about to talk about is going to be compromised because you're not showing up at your personal best. You can't have a team that's high performing if the individuals on it are somehow pulled out of stride and sub-optimized. The, the second thing, oh, these are the slides from the deck. So if you weren't in that meeting, we have slides like this, which are to help you identify what you need to do to get back in stride. And I left them in here. So when we send this slide deck out with the recording, those of you who want to be able to drill into these resources, have them at your fingertips. The second ingredient was that if you're going to have a team at a, at a high performance level, they've got to be able to talk about the real issues in the team. And if they don't have the awareness of where they're similar and different to each other, and then the safety to speak their truth, then people start to hide. Some people say to us, if the group's too big, like when you're doing a virtual meeting, if you have 25 or 30 people, it's too big and, and allows people to hide. Well, the same is true if you've only got six people in the room, but they don't feel safe or they don't understand how to show up or how to interpret each other. Then when people talk, they're gonna get either dismissed or rejected or somehow misunderstood. And so having the awareness of how people show up and then creating that psychological safety. And that is best done by you as, a, as either a leader or as a confident member of the team setting the example. And again, you do that best if you're in stride. And that's what this orange box here on the right shows, that if you're going to show up with confidence and courage and have a real conviction, when people are out of stride, we find that that's what gets compromised. People, when they talk about showing up as their best, a lot of people think about that's, you know, performance and efforts, but it's also about personality and whether you go to a positive place or a dark place when people say things, you know, do you stay constructive or do you get defensive, right? That's all part of what happens when people are in stride. So it's really incumbent on if a team's going to be high performing to create the, the dynamic that allows the team to be honest and open with each other, but to allow everyone to be visible. And that doesn't mean that people always need to be a loud voice. It just means that they're understood and, and acknowledged for who they are. The third ingredient was keeping a strategic focus. I haven't quite figured this one out, but I'll just tell you the default in, in people and in teams is to dig into the work. If people want to know what, what are my roles and responsibilities? What do I need to do so that I'm a success? And it becomes very task oriented. What do I need to do? 
what they lose sight of is why are we doing? What's the why? And as a leader and as a leader within the team, whether you're the designated leader or not, keeping the why alive, keeping people reminded of the vision, the mission, the cultural values, why we do the things we do, that is one of the most valuable contributions you can make within the team. I made the comment here about ecosystem versus silo because the old way was when you pulled a team together, people would look at who was in their team. And these days there's so much that's outsourced and dotted line and somehow dynamic that when people are working virtually, that opened up the possibility of not needing everyone to be like working in front of you. And so people these days think more about ecosystem. When we asked the question, in fact, we, we did a, um, I had a whole offsite all of last week and that whole offsite changed from having 15 people in the room to an, involving an entirely additional team because we asked the question, have we got the right people in the room? And when the leader said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, when I hear you talk, it seems to me like there's a whole group missing when you think about this from the point of view of ecosystem. So I think that's a really important component. Number four was leadership has got to model these ingredients. You know, whatever it is you're asking of the team, the leader sets the temperature, like it creates like a thermostat in the team. So whether it's around trust, whether it's about, you know, um, being open, whether it's about including everyone, no matter what their points of view, uh, no matter what their location, I still get people putting meetings on that suit certain time zones, not others. When speak, people from different cultures make a comment about something, you know, it can easily be dismissed if they're a minority culture. So being really open, this whole concept of inclusion, so that everybody, no matter their location, their race, their language, their culture, it's all included. That's something that leaders have to really embrace these days because, you know, the other day we were looking at hiring a recruiter. We've hired someone out of Israel, you know, and that's, a, that's not just another person. That's another person from a completely different time zone and culture. And so do we, do we embrace what that means when we start adding these people onto the team? That's a really, big, a really big piece of leadership these days and keeping the team as a team. Number five, having the right success measures. I would say this is way overlooked and way underrated in teams. Like particularly when you've got a team full of verifiers, you need metrics and measures to know if they're on track and succeeding and creating that winning feeling. And a winning feeling is a a big part of being a high performance team. A lot of people have got goals, they've got strategies, they've got priorities, you know, they've got the list. But if you said, have we actually agreed on the two or three things that are the, the truly important success measures, um, that's not often had a lot of time allocated to it or more the point is clear within the team. And then the last one was having the right governance. Like, okay, as a team, how, how do we do team? How often do we meet as a team? When we do meet, what do we spend our time on? Because so many teams don't really cover things that are of interest to the team. It becomes a talk fest for the leader or it's people just reporting on what their functions are doing, but they rarely solve problems together as a team. You know, there's, um, yeah, I think it's an area that needs to be consciously constructed around how do we establish the structure for success and the governance that makes that work? How do we make decisions? How do we ensure there's accountability and how do we ensure people stay aligned? Um, that All of these things need time. And I'd say when you're forming a team, we talk about the, you know, the, the forming, the norming, the storming. In this norming of the team, the setting up the right rigor, that's not something you can do in a meeting or a couple of hours. I would say that the first six months of ramping the team, you need to meet quite a lot to figure these things out, to figure out the success measures, to figure out the governance structure. It takes a lot of work. But once you get up on a plane of success and you've got momentum, you can probably ease back on the frequency of how often you need to talk these things through. So they were the six ingredients that we talked about. Um, I'll stop there in case anyone has any questions or anything you'd like to uh, contribute. I have a question. I was wondering yeah. where, because so many companies talk about their shared values and the values of the company and being true to their values, where do you see that fitting in with your six? That is, is that the sixth 
is that part of six or aligned values or is it somewhere over there with safety? I just want to in my mind, I probably should have added it here, Greg. I always think about vision, mission, and culture, like cultural values. So to me, that's all part of the strategic focus. I'll, I'll put that word in here, cultural values. Thank you. Now, it doesn't really matter. First of all, I would say to you, it's really important that it get covered, <laughs> whether you put it in, in number three or you put it in number six or anywhere else, you know, so long as it gets included. Um, but it's so important. I had the pleasure and really the privilege um, and some of my team were with me, meeting with uh, an organisation in Australia that is just a phenomenal success. I mean, it's been built to a, over a billion dollar business within a 17 year period. And it's just um, still you're scratching the surface on what it, what it could be doing. And I've been dying to understand what is behind that. You know, is there something unique about the ID makeup of that business? Um, what what makes it what it is? Is it is it boil boil down to just the leader? Is there something about the leadership team? And what I will tell you is the cultural values. It, it's probably other than what we do at, at you know Link Up and ID. It's probably the one of the other organisations I would know that put as much effort into their cultural values and keeping them alive and front of mind in their team. Um, that's not the only reason they're so successful, but it's very obvious and and you know yeah very prominent in that organization so i think it's a good call out greg thank you anybody else hey paul yes yeah, about I mean, the point point two which is awareness and psychological safety um what i personally found especially in large companies that's the hardest one uh, to to truly address. And it's being human behavior wise. Uh, what I've seen is uh, sometimes things, uh, uh, depending on the mood of the individual, I mean, it can actually go the other south, go south, you can say. And, uh, and that can have a adverse effect. All other ones, like for example, strategic focus and other things, those are still kind of with pointed questions and so on, but it's the point two, which is around psychological safety as to what we can talk openly within the team that I found to be very challenging uh, to, to develop. Uh, uh, with ID or without ID? With I mean, ID, with ID, I mean, okay. I mean, the, that's actually an area where with ID, we find that it, it typically is, I mean, that's our, that's our hallmark of success. I mean, that's what we do almost by, with a guarantee um, when we work with teams like to create that. So it may be the process that you're using, but either me or one of our team can certainly help you with a process that would help you get that accomplished each and every time. I mean, we, we actually have a survey that we do called the ID Impact Survey, and the results are phenomenal, you know, in terms of the um, consistency with which we are able to create that awareness and psychological safety. So um, after this call, if you want to talk about the process you're using and if there's a way we can help you with that, but there's definitely, I mean, that's where the ID really shines because it people people don't feel safe. It's really, it really comes down to a simple um, principle. When people feel that someone else gets them and understands where they're truly coming from, that is a game changer. When you don't feel understood, then the walls are up. There's a self-preservation mechanism that kicks in. I've actually had research done on this with the um, University of Ohio, where it is a, there's a proven you know, physiological change that occurs when people feel safe and understood versus misunderstood and judged. And that the ID, because it describes where each person's actually coming from, what their natural driver is, when that's facilitated, you know, properly, and people get that, then, um, and, and it's supported by a leader who sets the right example with that, then there is a very, you know, it, it's established very quickly, this foundation of psychological safety and trust that allows people to speak their truth. So um, that is our claim to fame. That is what happens. You know, if I think about building like a pyramid, you've got to have that base layer in place and 
I'm really saying, if you look at it like this, the first, the first layer of that pyramid is check yourself. And the second is create the foundation for everyone else to be open, honest, and speak their truth. And if you don't have that, then the, then the discussions around strategic focus, for example, and success measures are all compromised because people are just going through the motions. They're not really speaking from the heart and with real um, equity in the conversation. So that's that's the one that I mean we don't get we can we can facilitate and be a part of a discussion on strategic focus and success measures and so on. But that's really for the the team to go through and do. They know them best. W what we do is help create that foundation. So um, yeah, let's talk process afterwards if it if it interests you. Anybody else? Okay. So in terms of today, what we want to dig into is how you use the idea at both a personal and a team level. And we had some questions already. So uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy to you know, um, go through these if people have got other questions around the, the utilization of ID to make those six ingredients work, um, please feel free to ask. Does anyone have anything they would like to start with? Uh, or shall I just go through these ones that are here? All right, so let's start with these. The first is, how do you work with people with different IDs? You know, and people have said to me, oh, this, you know, we've got a team of 15 people, 15 IDs. Like, how do you, how do you actually keep 15 IDs in your mind and pay attention to everyone's needs? So, Rather than me ask that question, there's a number answer that question. There's a number of people on this call have been doing that for for years. What what's your experience like? How do you how do you pay attention to that diversity and factor in people's different IDs? Is it as simple as you remember them, or do you just remember certain parts, or how do you do it? Let's talk about how you what you found works for you to pay attention to looking after everyone's different IDs. Who would like to go first? Well, Paul, um, on, Paul if I... on... oh. carry on, no, Jane. No, you go. Just a quick one. Um, I've always used basically two principles. They're the under the under the counter operators, the people who do it quietly and slog it out, and there's the high profile. Um, heroes you know and i think the leaders got to deal with each one honor each one that they, they, they've got to and and the dangerous one is the people who are working under the counter who are sl slogging away and not not being too promotional and they are they are their efforts are tend to just be accepted that that it's going to happen, whereas the the more flamboyant pe people selling the issue tend to dominate, which can cause a little bit of confusion or a little bit of resentment from the sloggers. You know, so I always find that's worth uh, focusing on. So, you, are you saying you pay attention to the sort of dominant people? Um, well, they tend to they tend to lead lead the way, and they tend to be a lot more vocal and a bit more um, in the celebrity spot, if you know what I mean. Um, where, whereas the people who are slogging it uh, tend not to self promote, and their efforts are tend to just be accepted as part of the role and the res responsibility, and. It's great to differentiate the two, especially as groups. It's, it's very easy to miss the efforts of the low profiles. Okay, thank you. Joe, were you going to say something? How do you, how do you work yeah. with others and pay attention to the different IDs? Um, I guess um, one of the ways I do it is probably having different forums um, for communication. So, um, for people I know that um, need 
I guess it, it's thinking about the whole team and then people who need the upfront information or have pre information or provide information for them or discussions with them up front so that they're aware and they're prepared for a maybe we're coming towards a team meeting or something like that so they've got the data that they need and they can start thinking about it and when I'm talking to other team members I encourage them to do the same so I very much keep I'm just thinking about one particular client that we've I've been working with for about 18 months to coming up two years and we did ID very early on. The the um, CEO has really taken to ID really um, significantly. We're working through the whole team. So it's very much about being intentional about keeping the, um, not necessarily using the words, but keeping the, the ID in the conversation and, uh, and then acknowledging different people's needs so that I can... And I'm encouraging others to recognise that different people need different things. Time up front to think, information up front. Um, you know, these people you can pretty much dump something on straight away and they'll make it work, but these people you can't. So it's a real um, it's a real team effort. That's for the people you, I know. Do you, um, do, you, people, do you tend to just remember their IDs? Or um, do you no, I've got, I've got well, a mixture, really. Um, people I work with a lot, I tend to remember pieces of their ID probably rather than their full ID. Um, yeah but probably their key drivers and uh, and then I refer to that a lot and I also refer it to them so that they can actually remember um, and keep it relevant in what they're doing and, and, and consider that themselves and what they need and what they need to ask for. So it's very much about, about keeping it in the conversation and I also have charts up around the place of the teams and their different IDs on one page uh, in a graphical form so people can actually identify that and very quickly because a lot of people I'm very visual a lot of people I know in those organizations are very visual so it's a very quick way of just keeping it up in front of center and it just and and by bringing that up in conversations you know like oh you know we know that John really needs to have information up front so let's make sure we give him that or oh you know Brett's okay we can dump something on him in a couple of minutes he'll 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 make it work and and so it's just really about having it in the conversation all the time thank you but making thank it relevant you know, when my kids when my kids started school, there were 930 kids in the school, and the school principal knew every single child by name, and then she knew most of the parents by name and their circumstances. And if if a person can do that for 930 children and families, I sort of feel it's incumbent on a leader who might have you know 15 people or even the skip level, like let's call it 100 people. I think it really is part of good leadership to make a point of understanding your people. And that's that's beyond just ID. That's understanding yeah. their stories, their world, their families, like really understanding the people. And if, you know, when I, again, when I look at the best leaders, they know their people, you know. And um, I, I find it interesting how I still get that sort of sense from some leaders of I'm, I'm so busy and I don't know how you meant to stay on top of and like busy on what? What could possibly be more important than understanding your people and getting the best out of them? And I saw Alona made the comment in the chat that if you if you spend time with them and have the conversation, you tend to remember them more, you know, as opposed to just seeing a number on a chart. So I think it goes beyond ID. I think it's actually about uh, understanding. Can I have one of those, Joe? Understanding their story. It's about understanding all of the person, you know, mm -hmm. and then the, the other word that I, I think you mentioned, Joe, was need. If if you you can either anticipate their needs by understanding their ID and think, okay, so they're a verifier, so they'll need information in writing or send it to them in advance so they can read through it. But even if you just ask them, you know, what do you need? Because that the second question on the screen is if you don't know their ID. Well, if you don't know their ID, you can still ask them, what do they need? And what I find is that when people firstly feel that you understand them, we talked before about they, they feel that you get them. But secondly, if you, even if you don't know their ID, if you use the word need, it speaks to the ID within them. And the ID within them answers that question. And therefore, even if you don't know their ID, you can still work better together by addressing their needs. But you've got to ask them, the need question not want not prefer not what's irritating them what do they need that word is the word that speaks to id 
Yeah. And everything that Joe just said, you know, if you're having a, a group meeting, it's all that stuff needs to be taken into consideration of sending out stuff in advance. And then also knowing that some people may not have read it. So how do you do like a quick wrap up at the beginning to like, here's the objectives for today and here's what we hope to accomplish and doing a check-in to make sure, you know, everyone's like there and present and ready for the meeting. So just kind of touching on every direction of every drive without saying, now I'm going to talk to the verifiers, you know, or the, or the avoid ver whatever it is, but just making sure that you're kind of touching on all the needs that, you know, at least one of the needs for each of the drives and, you know, wrapping it up in a bow at the end, making sure people know what to do when, make, you know, the check-ins, all of the stuff you can do as a leader just to be inclusive of everyone. And, you know, asking, you know, instead of saying, you know, are there any questions? It's asking more open-ended, like, you know, what have I missed? What is missing here? What do you see? So that that starts more of a conversation than just the black and white, yes, no. Well, absolutely, Patricia. And then just making sure that most people, or if not everyone, has had their contribution. You know, if someone's being particularly quiet, just checking in with them. I've got to say, I was thinking about this when I was preparing for today, and I thought, okay, if I'm communicating with my team, do I do I sit there and construct an email or prepare an agenda or, or you know, a structure for a meeting trying to factor in everyone's IDs? Not really, you know? Like, probably not. Um, but... It, but once we get into the meeting, that you know, you, you know the conversations you're having, you, you make sure everyone's included. Now, that's not to say if I'm writing an email to one person, I'm absolutely thinking of their ID. You know, if if depending on whether they need detail or bottom line or would rather talk, you know, live and always thinking of their ID. When it comes to working with a group, I think you've got to you try and factor in. Like obviously, if the culture of the group was all you know, a particular style of ID, like all authenticators are all completers, you might then adjust the, the, the approach. But for the most part, when there's diversity, I think the, the bulk of that effort really applies when you're in the conversation with them um, and making sure that everyone has a voice, everyone's been heard, and that people are speaking their truth. So mm -hmm. you do that by creating that psychological safety that we talked about. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's similar when you don't know their ID, right? It's asking. And it's also trying to cover, if you have a big group of people and you don't know their idea, it's kind of covering all the drives in you know, the process of whatever meeting you're in. Yes. Paul, Thanks. there's another thing about leaders in terms of them all being a demonstration of the code and the values and so forth, but they also have to be able to pull up the team members that are out of line as well sooner so that people go, ah, oh, that behavior is not tolerated here. I have some leaders that are trying to be friendly and helpful and, and patient with things. But when they let certain behaviors go that are contrary to the code and the practice and the, even getting things done, they wind up poisoning the team because everyone goes, ah, okay, it's the old broken window. We can get away with that stuff here. And that's a tough conversation for some because it could be a pal or it could be someone you, you like a lot, but you gotta, you gotta be able to pull people up and leaders that can't pull people up and leave them their dignity, um, they wind up eroding their own teams, I think. Such a good point, Greg. Such a good point. You know, I was just thinking as you're saying that, if you come up with that governance structure and all the different rules of engagement for the team, but then it doesn't matter if people don't comply. Um, that, it's such a good point. How do you how do you go about making that happen, Greg? <laughs> that's where all my work comes from, getting them to do it. <laughs> it's like that's when we get called in when they don't. And at the end, we did it one recently down in Melbourne. I said, you know, you could have done this. You could have done this without me. You didn't need to go to all this expense. He goes, yeah, but you know what? I didn't. Right. And, and, I, and he went, I, I, I said, well, maybe next time. He goes, yeah, you know, I've got a job. This one's yours. And at, at one level, I was, <laughs> it was one level. I was going, okay, I laughed. But I went, yeah, we have to talk. <laughs> so. So really, it's it's giving them a way to do it. They often don't know how to pull people up without hurting them, destroying them. But they're also afraid. Some people just don't want to have the conflict, you know, and or they and they go to the wrong end. They go to bully end. So I think role modeling is an important way to show them how to do it. The leader casts the shadow. 
Well, there's almost an ID session in that, isn't there? Like different people, different IDs need to be pulled up different ways, you know, um, a, a way of doing it to one person. Who were we talking to the other day and someone was offended? Oh, I was in a meeting with one of my team and we were sort of mutually offending each other, you know, as the board authenticators, we were taking stuff very much to heart. And there was someone else on the call who was an authenticator. And I, after the call, I made a comment about, um, that was a pretty robust conversation. He goes, not to me. I thought that was an excellent conversation. We were talking about the things that we really need to talk about. So you could have you could have authenticators in that case saying something, and that was a really great meeting. You got people walking away from that meeting hurt and offended and shrinking, you know, wanting to hide in their shell. So that clearly there's a different way of um, we talk about giving feedback, but when you when you call people out, there's calling them out in public. Is calling them out privately, and then there are different methods of doing that. So I can understand why it would be a sensitive point for people to address, Greg. Um, there's probably a, as I say, there'd be a, a training that you probably several trainings you could do on, you know, how to actually do that effectively given the different ID makeups in the team. Again, yeah. I would suggest that it starts by that leader being in stride. You know, they, if yeah. they're going to be constructive, not be the bully, for example, they need to be in a really good place themselves. And they've got to be the role model everyone else sees when you need to call someone on something. We just call call it sooner. This is the way we approach that. We just call it sooner so it doesn't get so big. And and there's lots of little ways of just asking the question, not accusing, you know, not being judgmental. Just go, sorry, I'm a bit confused. And um, that that call it sooner has to be a code within the place, I find. Otherwise, things just grow bigger and, and rot. <laughs> Well, they're going to ultimately they're going to address it anyway you know how many people go through a divorce or something you know 10 years later and go you know in fact it happened to us this week a really close friend of ours let us know that they're separated they're, or they're separating and when we talked to one of them the the new well, you know i've been putting up with it for 10 years and i thought this and i thought that but i should have listened to my heart 10 years ago and so on so we know we the, the message i think you convey is we often know it's and we're going to end up having the conversation the sooner you have it, the less destructive it typically is. So getting people to feel, uh, you know, ownership of that and to and to then do that, I think would be a great contribution you can make as a, in, in your role, Greg. Well done. All right. Anyone else? All right. Let's 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 move on to the the third question we got here was. What about when employees have got similar IDs but show up drastically differently? How do you guys explain that? So you had two people that had, you know, I'll pick a number who's someone on the on the screen. Doug, 7643. You have two people, 7643, but they show up totally differently. You're in a team and somehow people are wrestling with that difference. How would you explain that? Well, that's a very good point. Um, I find some of the the best colleagues I've had have been same IDs, um, and some of the most fractious situations I've had is where we're all on the same ID, but we've got competing interests in exactly the same drives, and that can really throw a cat in, into the into the equation. It 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 gets quite heavy, especially that verified drive. Because we're, of course, right all the time. I mean, what's the problem there? And then somebody has a different right. I mean, that's terrible stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Anyone Doug else? was being sarcastic, just in case um, anyone didn't pick it up. Who was being sarcastic? Oh, Doug. No, yeah, that's right. I, I look. I, I would. I'm going to put things out there, and then you guys can talk to these. There are typically three reasons that people show up differently, even though they've got the same ID. One, you, you hear it. Well, Doug just mentioned one of them. If you've got different definitions within even the same drive, right? So the definition of right can be different, even if you've got two verifiers. What's a priority to one person is different to another person. So that can be one reason people show up or aren't the same. The second is what we call onion skins. There can be different life experiences um, and just, you know, 
the wholeness of the person as opposed to just the ID, that when you add nature plus nurture, that permeates through to different personalities, the outer layer, if you like, of what we see in the person. That's the second. And the third reason is whether the person is in stride or out of stride. And when I started with ID, I didn't know any of that. I was, didn't even know about you know the, the, the relationship between nature and nurture, how that would work and so on. But I thought that had a lot to do with it, the, the, that the, there's the inner layer of the, of the nature and then all these other outer layers. I, I you know, didn't take long to draw the conclusion that the biggest of those circles was the nature circle, like the sun in the solar system. It's the huge one and it drives it. Um, I, I think there's probably less to do with that, the onion skins and there's probably more to do with whether the person's in stride or out of stride. And I, I would totally recommend that when you see differences, you're doing everyone a favour to start there. Because even if there are onion skin differences, if the people are out of stride, even having honest, you know, real conversations about any other reasons are all going to be compromised while other people are out of stride. So the place to always look to and help with is helping people be in stride. And when they when they are, you're more likely to resolve anything that's remaining. But they're the three that I see. I'm curious to, with people who've had experience with this, anything else you might offer up? Yeah, Paul, I've just added in there about how well people know themselves and how prepared they are to show up and own, own it and be vulnerable. So, you know, because often we can say to people, well, you know, and talk from our knowledge of stride and what we observe and what we hear and all that. But if people aren't willing to um, admit, be accountable, whatever, that's often when um, they can just um, try and throw it off with something else or blame somebody else or blame the other person or whatever that is. So I think that's another, possibly a fourth dimension. So, well, yes, and I think we sort of hide that in onion skins a little bit. Joe, but it's worth pulling that out because you're talking about um, self-awareness, you're talking about self-acceptance, and then talking about what that does to someone's level of personal security, you know, and we have that in as one of the layers of the onion skin, but it's very much actually linked to whether they're in stride or not, you know, um, and in stride does to stay in stride and not get, you know, not sort of vacillate too far to the left and right of our peak performance indicator does mean that you, you need really good self-awareness and I would add self-acceptance, you know, just coming to grips with that. I literally ran into a lady this morning. I've talked, in fact, she's <laughs> she's been on one of our webinars. Some of you might remember a lady called Lauren. Um, her and her husband owned a, um, a home, uh, what do you call it, a staging business, you know. I interviewed her maybe a year ago. And she's the strong improviser and her husband is as far to the opposite end of her world as you can be. And she never checks the letterbox. And he was going, having to go at her the other day about, you know, the letterbox is full of mail, right? She's like, Jeff, we've been married 10 years. I never check the letterbox. Like, you've got to accept that. you just got to accept that, you know. And that, in her case, she's like acceptance of others. But, but people struggle with that just of themselves. And even though, it, even though they can know it and they can even know it through ID, truly coming to grips with your makeup and, and who you are and what the vulnerabilities of that are, that's maybe for some people like a never-ending journey. Susie, what were we talking about the other day about the avoid completes and forgetting things, um, the guilt that is there for forgetting things? And it's so common in so many avoid complete people. And, and yet you can explain it. Like the number of people over 30 years that have said to me, is that why I don't remember the birth of all of my children? You know, and people, most people would be totally either embarrassed or just not going to say that, and especially to the children involved. And yet secretively to me, they've shared, you know, those sorts of things um, where they just don't remember. And I say, everyone says, you know, one of the most impactful days is, is the day my child was born. And I don't actually remember all of them, you know. Um, but there was something else there, Susie. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> That's really funny because I was going to say I can't remember. Um, <laughs> but it, 
it started with something to do with one of my girls and it was um just one of one of those moments where you just feel guilty for not actually really remembering something um Izzy asked me a question on the spot she was having a conversation at work um and she messaged me and she said oh hey mum we're just having this chat at work I remember you saying that when before I was born dad was going to call me something really unusual and like my first instinct was like oh my god I I need to remember this but I can't but then it thankfully came to me within within a moment and it was right and she she felt really good that I'd remembered and but like a, that is that kind of first instinct is sometimes there's those things that are important but you just don't remember and it's not malicious it's not because you don't care enough it just literally don't remember mm. um so yeah that that's kind of where it came from yeah, that's right. I, I now I remember. Yeah. And, and the, the, the guilt, there's still like a guilt and you have yeah. to do the work to then sort of go, no, no, that's who I am. And and the and the other flip side of that is I don't remember some of the precious times, but I equally don't remember the hurts that other people might carry with them as a sack full of stuff, you know. Um, and so truly, I think self-acceptance is a, another area like, Greg, when you were talking before about calling leaders out, self-acceptance is another one that maybe there's a way of doing that for different ids but man that's not self-awareness is relatively easy to get self-awareness self-acceptance i think takes a lot more work for the avoid completes i did i'd never heard this about not remembering or if I heard it, I didn't remember it. Um, <laughs> does is this also the reason why a lot of our avoid complete leaders like have no recollection of a decision that was made <laughs> that we all are marching off to execute against, perhaps? Absolutely. Like no recollection. And I, I could tell you for me, that would be as recent as probably within the last 24 hours where I was doing something and someone said, We've actually done this before. We've we've already had this conversation. And honestly, as I'm as I'm saying the words, I'm having a deja vu experience because it did happen yesterday, and I don't remember who it was, but it was absolutely that's that's my life, you know. And whether it's decisions or whether it's like slides that we prepare, and I'll start preparing something from scratch, and someone says, "Paul, we've already got this." In fact, we've already built this presentation. I'm like, really, <laughs> you know? So yes, and it is the world and the like, the vulnerability and the pain point. For many avoid completes, I won't say every single avoid complete person because some people have compensating factors, um, but so many people will make a decision to your point, Andrea, and within a very short period, like I'll say weeks, are uh, acting as if that decision never occurred and they've just entirely forgotten it. Well, I'll have, I can have a separate conversation on the side. So I was trying to have, because I work with a lot of avoid complete leaders and you know we do need to take action and we need we do need to make progress amanda and i over here commiserating probably um so i'm like okay well what if in this slide deck we're using for discussion purposes we show it's under construction until you agree that yeah that's the way we want to go and once you agree and we say paul agreed on this day then it's sort of our decision record it's no longer under construction and we can go off and execute with relative confidence that we'd be able to remind you then of, oh, remember, we have this thing where you said that you wanted to do. Is that helpful or is that just not helpful at all because you're also leveraging the use improvised to come up with a better, faster, stronger idea than the one we talked about the last time? I think it's probably that combination of avoid complete and use improvised that is at play. Great question. Great question. So for those of you who may represent what Andrea is talking about, how would you answer that? What, what would you want her to do? Because I'm getting a new boss who's 5628 and I'd really like to know. Yes, yeah, so I'm looking at people like Patricia and Richard and Susie and Joe and Greg, you know, people have got yeah. that boy complete improvised combination. Yeah, what and I, you know, you know what I'm well, thinking? Oh, sorry, yeah, Patricia. So, so for me, I mean, I'm also using authenticate. So if somebody says, can we make like a soft decision or what? I, I know those aren't the words used because, you know, I can't remember what you used. However, if, 
if if you know you say let's talk about it and but then we're going to make you know we're going to decide this is the direction we're going to go will you commit to it i would say yes and i would commit to it however if something came about that would have like make it even more of an impact i would have the conversation but i wouldn't just change it i would say hey andrea you know and I, you know, I worked in corporate for years and had to have these conversations or had people have these conversations with me where I'd say, okay, you're right. I'm changing all the time. So let's make a decision. And if I have things that I want to change, let's have the conversation again and see if it works for you, if we change it a little bit, because then I think it kind of diffuses it for you a bit. I don't know, Andrea, how would that work? That's for you? helpful. I was also thought I was being really slick and I'm working in the checkpoints. And then we're going to go along at this point and we're going to come back and we're going to we're going to check in. And like that's part of part of the plan. Um so yes that that's good. And but I appreciate your approaches. You would have a conversation. Um you know but it's helpful. It's like I get it. You've got eight million things going on. Also, it's helpful to kind of have a decision record. So if you come back, Patricia, and you say, oh, what about this idea? We can say, oh, you had that idea. Here are the things you talked about. And here's why you made the decision at that time. What has changed since then? Exactly. And what's remained um, the same too? Because I think that would be helpful for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm just sitting here laughing. But I have um, to that's right. I was just sitting here laughing. I was thinking, and to Greg's point, it doesn't matter what what frameworks and things we put in place. Just remind me that we've put the frameworks in place and that we need to talk about it again. And 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 then let's have another conversation about it because I'm sure there's probably been some other ideas that have come up in the meantime. <laughs> I just love I love the complexity of IDs every day. I love it and appreciate it. Andrea, another thing that might help is that we, when we don't remember something like that, it, that's all it is. That doesn't mean that we also that and we also that and we also that. It's just that. And so the more you just bring it back to the point and, and remove any sense of um, judgment or disdain or, <laughs> or frustration, then we can move on. We're ready to go. We're ready to go. And if we have to go, oh, God, she's pissed off. You know, <laughs> that's sort of like, slow I don't care that. where we go, Greg. Let's just decide and, and get going. You know? Yeah, exactly. So just, the, just, I just, just want to go somewhere. Back, back to the topic. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that's one of the quick ways. <laughs> it really you. matters. And to me, it's like we don't need all of the information about it. Often we just need a reminder where it's like, oh, yeah, we did that. It's over here or remember this or whatever it is, because often that tiny little spark will bring us right back to it. Not always, but. Um, that's why the the brevity or the sort of the poke is really helpful. The, the happy poke. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I saw that in the chat, and I think it's a really important nuance. Is that when the completer person who it does stay in your mind more consistently does remind them. It's reminding them without any emotional attachment to it. Other than uh, Greg said it, it's just that. You know, it's not, I do hear people say at times things like, well, obviously, you know, it wasn't a priority to you. And obviously, you know, um, you, you know, even, even there's an another email, reason. As I said in my previous email. Yeah, you don't, need to, like, Ugh, you don't need to write that. And it's like, you don't need to write that. We're like, very good about assuming positive intent for the, you know, across our teams in general. It's like, I don't, I don't believe that you are intentionally trying to it, there's nothing nefarious so you're not trying no one's trying to make anybody's life difficult here yeah and so we do lean on that a lot but I'm truly looking for practical you know tools and approaches that that can have a positive impact that work for um that ID mix and also for mine as well you know so that we can progress and we can we can be a high performing team which is what we're trying to talk about here um I think I think one of the simplest things to know, Andrew, is it's it's not a negative for an avoid complete person to be reminded. It, it okay. is more of a negative for a completer. But but those of us who are avoid complete actually love it when we get reminded. Like it, it's so helpful. We feel bad. There's a part that feels bad because oh, you know, should have remembered or whatever. But we know it could have been really bad if we didn't. So when you remind us, it's like you're you're saving us early from what could be much worse. And we really appreciate it. So don't ever feel any trepidation about that, that point of reminding someone to stay on track with the decision that was made previously. 
And, and I, I will say that I think we had this conversation last week during training is that, and I'm going to avoid complete, I feel on my part, it's disrespectful for me to have to have somebody to remind me to do something. So I've worked real hard to put stuff on the calendar or, you know, whatever it is to where I remind myself, because I, I think that asking somebody else to continue to remind me on things just is, you know, that's not showing them the respect that I think they should have. And I still appreciate it. So that's, that's a great yes. example <laughs> of what I was saying before. I Sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying it's a great example of there are a lot of avoid completes that have come up with mechanisms because of that reason, Patricia, or for example, whether it's around simplicity or whether it's around respect, but they've got a mo an underlying motivation that has, you know, caused them to create um, a way to compensate for that. But that that's on, for example, some task. If we go to the example that Susie mentioned about just remembering a, a thing from 30 years ago, you probably didn't write that down or have that in the calendar or, you know, it can still bite you. Um, but I think it's just good to know that when it comes to the task side, not only are there people that have got mechanisms um, for a lot of avoid completes, it's not a cop out to say, well, you know, you better remind me because I'm probably not going to get this done. There are things like what you're saying that you can do to make sure that you are more accountable and that you follow through, even if it's not your natural instinct. Let's move on and cover a couple of these other questions here. Um, how, to, how to get buy-in from all team members. Uh, is this necessary in order to drive conversations about increased performance? So do you need to get everyone buying in? Or if you've got like a core group of, if you've got 30%, 40%, 70%, is there is there a number that instead of having to address all the drives and make sure everyone buys in, um, could you do it by getting just either a small number or some other approach? What would you say to this point about of getting buy-in and engagement from everybody given diversity of IDs? It's a great point. Can I, can I just say, Paul, I tried to find the key influencers or the key opinion leaders in the groups. Like I was yesterday, I was um, doing a, a mission, vision, value, a vision, mission, values workshop with about 30 people. I knew four of them. I didn't know the rest of them. Um, and um, and so I'm and some people are very passionate about that stuff and others aren't. And there was a handful of people missing. Um, so I actually asked the, the CEO, said to her, look, you know, the people who are missing are they key opinion leaders and are they likely to influence the group positively or negatively about not being here? And so, you know, and she said, no, they're not key influencers. Um, so uh, essentially I, I tend to find that I try, I think it was like, um, I can't remember, Catherine, uh, might have been Catherine, who was saying before, can't remember, um, was setting up a group, <laughs> I can't remember, I forgot. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And um, so it's it's about uh, looking to set the, the group or the meeting up as best as possible to try and, and, and have the structure of the meeting, especially if I've got a workshop that was like about over five hours or more. Um, so it was actually having it set up so that it met multiple people's needs. So I considered different aspects of how we were going to engage with each other to meet different people's needs. And um, Therefore, it 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 really helped because I and I and, and it looked like I'd say ninety five percent of the people were engaged in the in the whole process the whole pretty much the whole time so it seemed to work um, apart from the fact that people are very passionate about what they do anyway but um, it just helped because of the the variety of um, processes and practices that I use to engage people in a different way so it sort of got everybody on board, not all together necessarily all at the same time, but said things also the same thing in different ways to try and get the verifiers and all those sorts of things. So I think variety and flexibility is the key to my mind. Thank you, Joe. Well, well I um, uh, really like to reinforce the principle of cabinet solidarity. Uh, that's you, know, you debate long and hard and vigorously, uh, but once a decision is made, then everyone needs to support it. Yeah, it's a really important team norm, that one, and, and one that's, you know, I think takes 
a certain amount of two steps forward, one step back before people really get what that means, you know, because it's still so easy when the group agrees to something, but it wasn't what your personal choice would have been to say, well, what the, what the group decided to do and what they decided to do, as opposed to we agreed, you know, and therefore as a member of the team, I still find, I've got to say, as recent as last week, I think there's a lot of teams that, and, and I'll, I'll say leadership teams here, but or that, although we could argue all of them are, where they don't actually think of themselves as a team. They're, they're really just a group of individuals who have a collective common goal, you know, and they've got their individual part of a jigsaw puzzle that they particularly, that they respectively look after. But they don't actually think of themselves as a unified team, having a common voice, a, a mutual responsibility, and that sense of one voice, you know, one team, one voice. Even if it wasn't your preference, you still speak as a member of the voice of the team. Um, that's a, that's not automatic. And, and again, this concept of norming a team and, and what does it really mean? There's, there's like like any decision, you to make the decision, say, so what does that actually mean now? You could say the same thing about cabinet solidarity. And I, I think it takes all of these things need to be really fleshed out. So people say, you know, what does that look like really? And and what are we going to do to call it out if we don't do it? And yeah, it, it's the words I know people do understand, but if you said, do they play out, you know, do people practice cabinet solidarity? not until they truly see themselves as a unified team. Like, it's really a challenging norm. So good call out, Scott. Some really interesting comments in the chat that I, I think are worth calling out. You know, I would say uh, my experience is that if you want to see a group go in a direction, you've got to have a minimum sort of cohort of, that represents probably around 30% of the group. Now, you can have a dominator, you know, the just like dic dictator that says, this is what we're doing. But that's not with the buy-in. Um, some people take time to buy in. So you might have to move faster than that. But you, you want to make sure you've got an initial cohort of probably around 30% of the group. And I think, Greg, you made this comment. Yes. Um, try and get that group to be the influencers, you know, because... You, you do want to get to at least 70% over time. So you've got the majority of the group that's rolling along. Ultimately, if you get it 100%, that's great. But you've got to start with a, with a small, you typically get going with a smaller group, but then that group can help you get the, you know, double or more of that size, right? Get to 70, 80% of the group buying in. And then you've got much more sustainability of that same, of that same flow. But um, I think trying to get 100%, Whilst it's an admirable goal, you're going to be spinning for a long time to get the 100%. To move quickly, you've got to really get an initial cohort, like, like, often in change management, that you know, different names, but think of them as the early adopters. And then the people that are initially resistant aren't necessarily resisting. They've just got to work it through and they've got to process it. They need to see more examples or go and test some things themselves. So it's a journey that you take people on. Once you've got to that 70 plus percent level, you probably have, um, you know, more internal sort of combustion that keeps it alive more regularly. All right, we're getting close to the end of our time together, guys. Is there anything that anyone wants to share? We're actually over time. Is there anything that's hanging on for anyone that you want to cover? All right, well, with that, I will close out today's meeting. Thank you for being here. Thanks for all the contributions. Um, it always helps us just keep learning more and being better practitioners. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in a couple of weeks. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye-bye.